G'day, I'm Warwick Schiller and welcome back to another episode of The Principles of Training. Schiller and welcome back to the principles of training. In the previous episode we talked about the basically the human factor and the horse factor. The human factor would be the the principle of work with the horse you have today which means as a human you have to be right here present and working with what's going on in front of you. Not only does that help you make the right decisions but it helps these horses feel safe because they really rely on the fact that we are present in order for them to feel safe. The other part we talked about was the horse's emotional system. We talked about the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and relaxation state, and the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight state. So with humans, they say if you're depressed, you're living in the past, and if you're anxious, you're living in the future, and if you're peaceful, you're living in the right now. And so I think it's kind of the same with horses to where if a horse is in that <clears throat> parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest state, and he's grazing, and <clears throat> excuse me, something happens out there that bothers them, concerns them. They lift their head up, they're thinking, do I have to run? Is that going to come get me? Is it a danger? So they're no longer right here. They are thinking about a future event. And then if it goes away, they go back to being right here. So that's, you know, horse anxiety, I think, and human anxiety are very, very similar. And we can draw we can use what works with humans to actually help with horses a lot. So that's the anxious part. But I think horses that are shut down, which is the opposite of the, the, the anxious part, horses that are shut down, this is Sherlock. So he, he came to us as quite a shut down horse, quite a functional riding horse, but just quite shut down and on the inside. I think horses that are shut down are a bit like humans that have depression and they're in their head a lot. You know, you're just in your head. You're not really present here in your body. And so what we've got to be able to do with shutdown horses is be able to help them be a bit more present. I think, I think these shutdown horses get shut down and they get shut down because they, I think they're quite sensitive and they can't control to what happens in their surroundings. I really think that's the case. A lot of times these shut down horses seem like they're dull, you can't get them to go, those sorts of things, but I really think they're shut down because they can't control their surroundings. And so in this episode, I wanna talk about something that can help with those kinds of horses. And the thing I'm gonna talk about here is what I call stress indicators very subtle indications to us that the horse is concerned about what's going on right now. And these are way below the threshold of running away, things like that. But probably the, the biggest one I see in horses is if you go to approach a horse and as you approach them, they turn their head slightly away from you. And a lot of times if you watch them, they, if this was their eyeballs right here where my hands are, they will tend to turn their eyeballs slightly and turn their head slightly, but their eyeballs are turned a little bit more than their head. For me, they are telling you, whoa, slow down. It's almost a little indication like whatever you're doing is concerning me. And the thing is, if you can stop right there, step back and let them know that you saw that, that's groundbreaking as far as getting these horses to where they really start to can relax because I think they, when you do that, they realize that you notice that little thing. And if you notice that little thing, you also notice a lot of other things around here. So you'd notice danger so I could feel relaxed. And the first time I actually did this was at a clinic in Texas a few years ago. And I was working with a lady with a Mustang and it was the second day of the clinic and she's doing some groundwork. And what she was going to do was walk down the side of her horse here and just have him step over behind a little bit like that, just untrack behind. And what happened was she started to walk down there and whenever she went to walk down that side, hey mister, whenever she went to walk down that side, her horse turned his head and blocked her out. He kind of said, no, I don't think I want you to go down there yet. Now in the past, if a horse did that, let's say I went to walk down here and the horse turned his head and went to block me out, I'd kind of go, 
no, excuse me, I'm going down here and I'd continue down there. But what I did with this horse was when he turned his head, I stopped and stepped backwards. And I waited. And I waited for some sign that he was less concerned. It might be his ears start to flick, he might blink a little bit. I don't think he licked and chewed at the time, but he, you know, his eyes might have come back to working a bit instead of being blank stares. And I did that for probably five minutes until I could walk down that side and he would let me down. Now this horse had been ridden before, he's been ridden for quite a long time. And the problem this lady had when she came to the clinic is he bolts. So it doesn't seem like it's a groundwork problem, it's a bolting problem and he'll do it out of nowhere. He seems to ride around okay and then bolt. After I got to where I could walk down this side of him, then what I did was I thought, hmm, let's see what else I can find. So I took my hand and I placed my hand on his neck and as I got there, he raised his head up about half an inch. He said, that's slightly concerning. So I took my hand away and I stepped back and I waited for him to look like he'd processed that. So I probably did that little exercise for about five minutes. So it's been probably 10, 15 minutes or so. And then what I did was I said, okay, can I go from here? Can I walk around here and you don't block me out? Good, can I touch you? You don't raise your head up, good. Then I actually asked him to disengage behind, which is what the lady had been working on. And after a while it was fine. So I probably spent 20 minutes or so working with him. All seemed quite good. And so then I handed him back to her and she said, what do you want me to do? And I said, just hang on to him, see what he does. And so, uh, you know, I'll help somebody else. And I went and helped somebody else. And about five minutes later, there was a collective <gasps> a gasp from the, the audience and the participants in the clinic. And I turned and looked and this horse had buckled at the knees, laid down and gone to sleep and was almost snoring little dust clouds in the arena. And then he had a roll, then he got up, then he lay down, had a roll and went to sleep. And I said to the owner, I said, does he often do that? And she said, as far, I've had him for six years. He's nine years old, he's been out of the wild for six years. I may have seen him lay down out in a pasture once, but when I came along on the horizon, he jumped up, but he's never really, really done that. And so he slept for an hour until we were done with that session. The next day of the clinic, she brought him back out in the morning and I said, she said, what do you want me to do? I said, just hang on to him. She hung on to him, he lay down, went to sleep and slept for four hours. Other horses were riding around past him, different directions, none of that bothered him. She said she took him home and he slept for another four days, quite a lot for another four days. And then the thing that she had to report that was the big deal was he no longer bolts. Okay, so we fixed a bolting issue by just changing these little things and letting this horse know when we, when he started to become a little bit concerned. And it wasn't that he was no longer concerned. I think it was the fact that we were listening to him. Okay, the fact that we noticed when he said, hey, what are you doing there? And, and we kind of said, well, I'll, I can wait for you if you want. And it sounds like it's completely something so simple, but it was something so simple that was so, had such a profound effect on this horse. And that was the start of me really starting to realize those little things they do like that can really help you give your horse some confidence and it's so it's not so much about training them to do stuff it's about letting them know that you are a member of their herd that you are aware of what's going on around here and you pay attention to things and you know in the previous episode i talked about that ray hunt saying they know when you know and they know when you don't and that talked about they know when you're aware of what's going on with them and around you and they know when you are not aware of what's going on around you. They know when you're thinking about your shopping list. They know when you're thinking about what am I going to do when I get done here. They know when you've had a bad day. They can really read your energy. And so what we've really got to be able to do with these horses is to be present and in the moment with them. And I think if you can recognize those little signs that I call stress indicators, you know, people have different names for them. There's actually a book written about it, um, but they've got a different name for it. I've found it's easier if, if I, um, if I call them stress indicators, and they're just little indications that horse is starting to be slightly stressed. If you can stay below that threshold, that threshold of being concerned and worried like that, it can really have a profound effect on these horses. And you know, that was, uh, I think that was three years ago that happened and I spoke to the owner recently and that horse has not bolted since. So just being aware of that little thing right there and letting him know that we see those little, pieces of concern can really go a long way to completely changing how these horses feel 
when they're around us. And that's the big deal is we're not teaching these horses something they don't know. We are trying to reset these horses back to the state that they normally live in when they're in a herd. And in order to do that, we have to be part of that herd and we have to be as aware as everybody else in the rest of that herd. After I got back from that clinic and that huge change in that Mustang where he laid down and slept for so long, and he hadn't done that before in the last six years that the owner knows of, I really wanted to research horse sleep habits. So I looked into that and found out, as we, we all know, horses can sleep standing up. You know, they're a prey animal, so they have to be able to have a bit of a nap, but still be ready to run away if they need to. And I found out that horses, even though they can sleep standing up, we also know they sleep laying down and, and that when they're laying down, the sleep they have when they're laying down is different than the sleep they have when they're standing up. When they're standing up, it's a light sort of a sleep. The laying down, they have that REM sleep, that rapid eye movement sleep. And it's that deep restorative sleep that in humans we know if you don't get that sleep, you're irritable and anxious. And so just making that horse feel safe enough to lay down and have a sleep really got a huge change in him. The owner called me a month later and she said that he hasn't bolted since and she doesn't think it's gonna happen. And I've recently spoke to her and it was, it's been three years now and he hasn't bolted since. But after she called me and told me that and I looked into the, the research about the sleeping thing and thinking, okay, so maybe a horse not feeling safe enough to sleep can actually be the cause of a lot of issues if they don't get that deep REM sleep. But it really, had a profound effect on me because of the huge change in that horse and the little thing I did. And up to that point in time, I was a horse trainer and it was all about me training the horse, me telling the horse how to do certain things. And that particular instance, it wasn't me telling the horse to do anything. All it was was me telling the horse that I was listening. And so then I really went down this path of really listening to the horse more more so than telling them and the, the changes have been profound. I had a horse come to a clinic here at our place mm, a couple of months after that incident with that Mustang and this too happened to be another Mustang. He was, uh, he'd been out of the wild for, I can't remember, it may have been seven weeks. He had been a stay and he'd since been gelded and they'd had, I think they'd had 10 rides on him. So they'd done all the groundwork and had 10 rides on him when he came here. And I don't think they were having any problems with him. Oh, hey, mister. I don't think they were having any problems with him, but he was a bit robotic about things. And when they came in the arena to do some groundwork here, he just kind of stood, kind of braced. His neck was really high. His ears, his ears were kind of back. He didn't, he, uh, you know, wasn't really present. His eyes didn't blink. He was just kind of in shutdown mode. And with him, you know, the guy showed me some groundwork and the horse could do things. He could move here and move there and move body parts around or whatever, but it was all kind of robotic and it was all very stilted and, and not very connected. And so with that horse, I said, mate, do you mind if I take the lead rope? And I took a hold of the lead rope and I stood back here and Sherlock's kind of having a nap right now, but this horse wasn't napping. He was just standing there observing his surroundings, but very, very tight. And so I walked, I thought, well, I'm going to see what, see where I can find his threshold. And so I just walked towards him very slowly. And right about here, his head raised up a little bit. Hey, Sherlock, his head raised up a little bit like that. It was just a tiny little thing. And so I stepped back and I, as soon as he did that, I stepped back and I waited. And I waited till he blinked or his ears started to move. Anything to tell me that he was starting to come around a little bit. And then once again, I walked a little bit closer and his head raised up slightly. When it raised up, I stepped backwards. And that went on for, I may have done that for half an hour, you know, just doing that, stepping towards him, noticing when he said, ooh, what are you doing? And then stepping backwards to let him know I saw that. And then waiting until he was, he'd done processing that. So like I said, his ears might move a little bit. He might start to blink a little bit, things like that. And after about half an hour of that, he started to actually become interested in me. He, his ears started to work. It's like the lights camera action came on and he started wanting to kind of approach me and say hello, but he, he really couldn't do it. He'd have to step back. So after a while, I turned my back on him 
and stood like this and he started to come up behind me and sniff me a little bit and scoot backwards and he'd sniff me and scoot backwards and he'd sniff me and snort and scoot backwards and he was really trying to engage with me but he just couldn't bring himself to do it it was a bit too scary and so I thought well I'm going to make myself less scary I'm going to cross my legs and sit down and so I crossed my legs and sat down on the ground in the arena here and when I did he immediately spread his legs and urinated and there are a number of people here who said oh look he just he just relaxed right then and I said oh, I'm not sure if that's relaxation but I've since looked into scientists and they will tell you that a horse can hold urination until they feel comfortable and I think he finally felt comfortable enough to uh, let go that's all we did with him that day I put him away we got him out the next day and uh, the guy started doing some groundwork with him again and I said and once again that horse had that braced tight look about him so I said just let me borrow him for a second and once again, I did the same thing I did yesterday. I was just approaching him. And when he told me, oh, that concerns me a bit, I was just stepping back and letting him know that I saw that. I did that for a little while and he became alive much sooner. Uh, after all, he actually, while I was standing still, he spread his legs and urinated while I was standing up. And I think I was still facing him at the time. So he was really starting to, you know, engage with the real world while he was around me instead of being shut down and almost inside his head like say human depression is like uh, then i was standing at some point in time i was standing with my back to the camera and he was over here and all of a sudden his head went up and his ears got really bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and i uh, i commented at the time i said i really don't know what's going on here but it's a good thing and then at some point in time he took off and he walked around me in a half circle and uh, he had some energy you know when he'd been doing the groundwork the first day he was very stilted and robotic but he had some energy and this lead rope was slack like that and the first day when he was doing the groundwork the lead rope was kind of tight he was thinking out all the time but he went around me and then he went around in a half circle and he stopped and he backed up and I said well I'm not sure what that was and the owner was there and they said well Maybe he's protecting you from the chicken. So we've got chickens here and uh, they'd been roaming around the arena the day before. I looked over behind him and sure enough, there was a chicken walking towards us, walking towards us across the arena. And I thought, oh, I don't know if he saved me from the chicken. That's a bit of a stretch of the imagination. But then as that chicken became, came a bit closer, he actually walked around me, walked two circles around me in a you could call it a protective type gesture, but he was bent around me like this, okay? So there was some connection there. And then he walked around me twice and then he stopped and he kind of kept an eye on that chicken. And he kept looking at that chicken and when it finally went away, he kind of went back to being relaxed again. And once again, that was another profound thing that happened to me. That he actually treated me like a valuable resource, okay? Like part of the herd, something to be looked after. And up till that point in time, that's about the first time I've ever had a horse do something for me that I didn't ask him to do. So up till that point in time, you know, I've been very much a horse trainer and training horses to do particular things. But, you know, after both of those instances, it really got me thinking about a big part of what we do with our horses. Well, a big part of what we can do with our horses is be aware of like I called them before, stress indicators. Little, little, little things that tell you I'm starting to get concerned. If you can think about those things, it's been profound. I've had some amazing changes at clinics with horses just by doing that. And that might make me all I do the whole clinic is just step towards them and step towards them and when they tell me they're a little bit concerned step backwards and I might do that for a couple of hours and then they've done all sorts of amazing things they've laid down they've rolled that they've never rolled before they've never laid down in public before they've never laid down with a human standing near them they've done, they did all sorts of things and the laying down some people get all concerned about the laying down like oh I've been doing that my horse didn't lay down the laying down is not something you should or shouldn't have but it's an indication of their their mental state you know it's an indication of how relaxed around us they are and if you think about it, like I talked about the zebras the zebras only lay down because they feel the other ones are aware enough to alert them if something was some danger was going to come along and I really think those horses laying down around us once we start being aware of all these little things that they're telling us I think the reason they lay down is because they 
they, they start to feel safe around us. And so this whole series, I'm gonna be talking about different things we can do to help those horses feel safe around us. But I really think that one of the first ones is these, what I call stress indicators. And sometimes the horse will just do them without us doing anything. They'll turn, like I said before, they can turn their head slightly away from you. When they do, if they do that with me, I'll just step backwards and wait. Sometimes you'll be actually doing something with them and maybe they raise their head up slightly. If they do that, you can step back and let them know. But the big thing is about letting them know that you see their level of concern. And as we go along, I've got quite a bit of footage I can show you on different horses I've worked on this stuff with. But for right now, the, the thing I really want you to get is these stress indicators, those horses communicating with us that they are starting to go out of their parasympathetic nervous system into the sympathetic nervous system. If we can recognize those things and step backwards, they feel so much more safe around us because as the saying goes, they know when you know and they know when you don't. So join us next time on the principles of training and we will go over more uh, techniques about how you can help your horse feel more safe and also things you can do yourself as a human to help your horse feel more safe. So we'll see you next time.